Uh, I will dispense with my usually long and learned introductions. <laughs> Get right into it. How Not to Die. That has got to be the best title for a book ever, and might explain why this otherwise learned volume has shot immediately to the top of all the bestseller lists and stayed there for a long, long time. My thought about How Not to Die is I'm in, Dr. Greger. Sign me up. Come on out here. He has the secret. There is a drug. There is a drug, and I'm going to let you tell them what it is. I'll tell. Yeah. Allow me to begin on a personal note. This is a picture of me taken around the time that my grandmother was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. She already had so many bypass surgeries that basically ran out of plumbing at some point. Confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. Then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is detailed in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death's door people. Frances Gregor, my grandmother, arrived in a wheelchair. Mrs. Gregor had heart disease, angina, claudication. Her condition so bad she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not only out of a wheelchair, she was walking 10 miles a day. This is a picture of my grandma at her grandson's wedding. 15 years after the doctors had abandoned her to die, she was given a medical death sentence at age 65, and thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet till age 96 to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. Now, years later, when Dr. Dean Ornish published his life, landmark lifestyle heart trial, proving with something called quantitative angiography that indeed heart disease could be reversed. Arteries opened up without drugs, without surgery, and just a uh, plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors in the majority of people. I assume this was going to be the game changer. I mean, I had seen it with my own eyes, my whole family had, but here it was in black and white, published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, yet nothing happened. So wait a second. If effectively the cure to our number one killer could effectively get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so busy folks like you don't have to. I then compile all the most interesting, most groundbreaking, the most practical finds to new videos and articles that I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There's no ads, no corporate sponsorship, strictly non commercial, not selling anything. Just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother. New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. So where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, you know, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what be one, may be one of our greatest medical discoveries, as noted by one of our greatest medical figures of the 20th century, Dr. Dennis Burkett, the fact that many of our major and most common diseases were universally rare there, like heart disease. For example, in the African population of Uganda, coronary heart disease almost non-existent. Wait a second. Number one killer almost non-existent. What were they eating? Well, they were eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens and their protein almost exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it. 
Uh, very similar to what one sees in kind of modern day plant eaters, that's about uh, 3.7 in Canadian units. So oh, wait a second, maybe they were just dying early from something else and never lived long enough to get a heart attack. No, here's age-matched heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. Out of 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. Out of 632 age and gender matched autopsies in Missouri, 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer. In fact, they were so blown away, they went back, did another 800 autopsies in Uganda, still just that one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death. Out of 1,427 patients, less than one in a thousand. Whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, is a disease that begins in childhood by age 10. Nearly all kids raised on the North American diet already have what are called fatty streaks in their arteries, the first stage of the disease. And then these plaques can start forming in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then start killing us off. So if there is anyone here today, older than age 10, <laughs> then the question is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease, it's whether or not you want to reverse the heart disease that you likely already have. Is that even possible? When researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of plant-based diet followed by populations that did not get heart disease, their hope was that maybe we can slow it down, maybe even stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. The disease started to reverse. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to dissolve some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, but were just never given the chance. This remarkable improvement in blood flow on the left here to the heart muscle itself was after just three weeks eating healthy. This is nothing new. We've known about this for decades. American Heart Journal, 1977, cases like Mr. FW here. Heart disease so bad, couldn't even make it to the mailbox. Started eating healthier. A few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. <laughs> now, there are these fancy new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market. Uh, it costs thousands of dollars a year, but at the highest dose may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. Does not look like those choosing the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon. See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper, but can work better because you're treating the actual cause of the disease. Right? It's only one diet that's ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, this plant-based diet. If that's all a plant-based diet can do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, uh, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet until proven otherwise? And the fact that it can also be helpful in preventing, arresting, or reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and hypertension would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Most d deaths in the United States are preventable and related to nutrition. According to the Global Burden of Disease Study, the largest study of risk factors ever published, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the number one cause of death the United States, and the number one cause of disability is our diet. Now bumping tobacco smoking to number two. Smoking now only kills half a million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more. What about Canada? The number one killer of Canadians is the Canadian diet. And again, tobacco got bumped to number two. 
So, of course, nutrition is the number one thing doctors learn in medical school, right? I mean, the number one thing your doctor talks to you about, right? Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker back in the 1950s. The 1950s, the average per capita cigarette consumption, 4,000 cigarettes a year, meaning the average person walking around smoked half pack a day. The media was telling you to smoke. Famous athletes agreed. Even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. I mean, look, you want to keep fit? Stay slender so you make sure to smoke and eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim, and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim, a lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? Although apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for a youth-oriented cigarette. They wanted to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative powers claimed by Philip Morris, but better be safe than sorry and smoke. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. No woman ever says, no, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. <laughs> After all, John Wayne smoked them until he got lung cancer and died. You know, back then, even the paleo folks were smoking, <laughs> and so were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Sure, you know, uh, many doctors smoke camels, but others uh, preferred lucky, so there's a little disagreement there. The leader of the U.S. Senate agreed. Who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? Maybe over in Flint, Michigan. <clears throat> But don't worry, if you do get irritated, your doctor can write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is an ad in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So when mainstream medicine is saying that smoking on balance is actually good for you, when the American Medical Association is saying that, where could you turn back then if you just wanted the facts, right? What's the new data advanced by science? She was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. <laughs> Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, that is, when he still could speak before he died of throat cancer. Now, by some miracle back then, there was a smokingfacts.org website that could deliver the science directly, bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters. You would have become aware of studies like this. This is an inventive study out of California, published in 1958, showing that smokers had at least 90% more lung cancer risk than non-smokers. Non-smokers, 90% less uh, lung cancer risk than smokers, right? But this wasn't the first. When famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked by his studies back in the 30s, linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was in the movies. It was everywhere. Medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. So, back to our little thought experiment. If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habits are oh, not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, you could have cancer by then. If you wait until the powers that be officially recognize it, like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, you could be dead by then. It took more than 7,000 studies 
and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report came out against smoking. Right? You think maybe after the first 6,000 studies it could have given people a little heads up or something? <laughs> Powerful industry. Right? Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. As a smoker in the 50s, on one hand, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. If you're even aware of studies like this, let's fast forward 55 years. You know, there's a new Adventist study out of California warning Americans about something else they may be putting in their mouth. Of course, it's not just one study. Recent compilation of all the best evidence to date suggests that mortality from all causes put together, many of our most dreaded diseases, cancer, stroke, diabetes, etc., significantly lower among those eating more plant-based diets. Animal products and processed foods may cause up to 14 million deaths every year. So, instead of a smoker in the 50s, right, imagine you or someone you know going along with America's eating habits today. You realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your eating habits not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it could be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the, uh, the medical community still dragged their feet. The doctor's always the last on board. Even the AMA actually went on record refusing to endorse the Surgeon General's report. Why? Could it have been they just got a $10 million check from the tobacco industry? Maybe. Okay, so we know why the tobacco industry is sucking up. Um, uh, the AMA is sucking up to the tobacco industry. But why weren't more individual doctors speaking out? Well, there were a few ahead of their time, speaking up against industries, killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemic of dietary diseases. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? The food industry uses the same tobacco industry tactics, twisting the science, misinformation. The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risks of cigarette smoke and toxic chemicals are the same paid for by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy and the same paid by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. 14 million people dead. Animal products and processed foods. Plant-based nutrition can be considered kind of the modern-day equivalent of stopping smoking. But how many more people have to die, though, before our government say, uh, don't wait for open-heart surgery, uh, to start eating healthier as well? Until the system changes, we need to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. Uh, we can't wait until... Uh, Society catches up to the science again because it's a matter of life and death. You know, uh, last year, Dr. Williams became the president of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked in an interview why he himself follows the same diet he recommends to all his patients, his plant-based diet. I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. Thank you so much. <laughs> 